There's a lot of interesting questions to answer in the universe, but perhaps there are none more interesting than where is the life? What does the life look like? Is life just on earth? Is life in other places? Now, I assume that when you think of life, the first thing that pops into your head is aliens, but the kind that is, are kind of like humans, they have two arms, two legs, two eyes, and they're really intelligent. They're really smart. And oftentimes we imagine them to be far superior, far advanced to us. And I think that that type of thinking is really just projection. The questions about intelligent aliens and even some of the theories that we put forth as to why we haven't found them is really a projection of how we think about ourselves. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Maybe you've heard of the Fermi paradox. Maybe you haven't. Enrico Fermi. Enrico Fermi. That's how they say it back in, in Italy back in the day. If there's such a high probability that intelligent civilizations exist, but we see no evidence of it, how? How do you deal with that dichotomy? It's only a paradox. It's only a paradox if the assumption that there's a high probability of intelligent life occurring is true. It's not a paradox if that's rare. The only reason it's a paradox is if it's true that this is a super common thing that happens. Now, I think that life is a very common thing. The best way to think about the likelihood of intelligent life or, or life happening is to think of statistics, to think of the probabilities. And that's exactly what the Drake equation does. The Drake equation was invented by Frank Drake. And I tr I mean, you. I trust it. I trust this guy. Just look at that face. I just trust him. I trust, I think it's the, if I was in a room with him, I feel like I would, uh, I feel like I would, I would trust him. It might be the chin. You get in the number of occurrences and that's gonna be equal to the star formation rate, our star. This is how quickly stars form in our galaxy. Uh, we know the star formation rate to be between like one to three stars per year. Stars have different masses. It's an estimation, but we know that it's on the order of a couple stars per year. It takes a long time for stars to form. First of all, a star doesn't form in a year. A star forms over, depending on the star, like hundreds of thousands to millions of years. Next, we have this FP term. This is the fraction of stars that have planets. And we have a good idea about this as well. So now that stars on average have about 1.1 planets. Most stars have more than one planet and there are some limitations here because we are not really sensitive enough to detect the low mass in small planets. Think Mercury and Mars sized planets. It's hard for us to detect these planets so we may be wildly underestimating the occurrence rate of small rocky planets. Next we're going to think about the fraction of planets that orbit a star that can support life, that are potentially habitable. So here things already kind of start to get tricky. When we think of habitability, we are thinking about some like Goldilocks zone around that star where the temperature is such that liquid water can exist. You may ask, well, why do we assume that other life needs water? And that's a good question. The answer to that is that we know that life for us needed water. So that's the data point that we have to go on. Unfortunately, we only have one. But more importantly, water is very common. If you ever get caught thinking like, well, we're just assuming that the life is like us. The, the thing that you have to realize is that water is abundant in the universe. It's very abundant. It's all over the place. It's on Earth. It was on Mars. There's evidence that it was also on Venus. We know that Pluto is like 30% water or something like that. Many of the other moons in our solar system also have water. Our moon literally has water on it. Like water is everywhere. So it's not some stretch to assume that it's a good place to start with water because water is all over the place. But it's not simply about being in the habitable zone. Venus and Mars, both have evidence of having water in the past, yet neither one of them has it now, not as a liquid. Yet both of those planets are in the sun's habitable zone. It's not simply enough to say that a planet has to be in the habitable zone. There's a number of other things 
that you have to consider, including the composition of the atmosphere. And it's not that simple either because planets migrate. A planet could migrate into the habitable zone. It could migrate out of the habitable zone. As stars age, they put out more energy, which means that as the sun gets older, the Goldilocks zone will push out further and further. In fact, in 500 million years or a billion years, the sun will heat up enough that Earth itself will not be able to have liquid oceans and life as we know it will not be able to exist on Earth. Okay, so next we have the fraction of these planets that can support life that actually do end up supporting life. And that really goes into all the things that I just said. It's like, okay, it's potentially habitable. Does it have all the right ingredients? Is it in the right location? Is the orbit stable enough that it's not gonna get too close or get too far? Is the star stable enough and calm enough and not like doing some weird activity that are making things uninhabitable or hostile to life? It's worth noting that on Earth, we have evidence that basically as soon as it was possible, single-celled, simple life evolved about 3.7 billion years ago, just about as fast as we think it could have happened, life evolved on Earth. And the fact that it happened so early on Earth would lead you to believe that it's something that happens fairly commonly. Next, we have this F by term, the fraction of the planets that do develop life that go on to develop intelligent or civilization. On Earth, I think that there are a number of intelligent species. You can develop intelligence without ever developing a civilization or a society, right? There are a number of intelligent animals that just don't have civilization. Next term is the fraction of planets that develop intelligent or civilizations that also develop technology that basically could be detected by somebody else. Humans have been around for 300,000 years about, and there were other species of human also. Civilization is pretty new. And technology that could be detected by some other intelligent civilization is brand new. Started using radio waves to communicate in the last couple hundred years. We started using rockets in the last hundred years. You know, this stuff is brand new. And to just assume that because that is something that we stumbled across means that that's something that all other intelligent civilizations or species do, to me, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And all you have to do is think about how long humans had civilization before we had that technology. Hundreds of thousands of years. It may be very rare. And the last term is the length of time that the signals that the civilization puts out can be detected. Uh, this one is kind of a toss up because yes, you need to be able to continue putting out the signal for it to be detected, but there's this like uncertainty with time because it takes a long time for these signals to travel through space anyways. And you could really think about creating satellites or probes that go out that extend that timeline. We sent out Voyager 1 and 2, uh, Pioneer 1 and 2, and we sent those out a while ago. Hypothetically, some intelligent civilization or whatever could find them in a million years, a million years, and we're long gone. Throw all these together, and there's uncertainties on several things like how many of these planets are actually going to be habitable? How will that life actually form? Will there actually be a mechanism that's gonna produce the type of intelligence that can ultimately go on to create signals or rockets or some sort of technology that could be detected by another species? Now, when you just think of the vastness of space, like of all the galaxies in the universe, there are trillions. Some of them have trillions of stars. I think for me, it's, it's almost impossible to believe that there aren't intelligent civilizations out there. But if you scale down your, your vision from the entire universe down to just our galaxy, which still has 100 billion stars, which is an incredibly large number, I think that that those numbers, it may start to taper off. Like it may be that, you know, the circumstances are actually kind of rare enough for each of those things to happen. Really only happens that there's gonna be 
one civilization at a time or maybe a couple at a time, but they're gonna be so spread out that they're never gonna really be able to communicate with one another. That makes sense to me. Frank Drake in his original equation came up with somewhere between 10 to 50 million, <laughs> between 10 to 50 million, um, which I mean, talk about covering the spread. The lowest, his lowest estimate was 10. I mean, one would be earth. One, the lowest estimate of one is basically like what you know for a fact to be true. We know for a fact there's at least one, right? It's us. So he says, you know, between 10 and 50 million. I would not, I, it's hard for me to believe that there are millions. And again, it's, it's, it's simply because there is just no evidence of, of it anywhere. And I hesitate when I start thinking of the humanoid figures that are always in our minds when we're thinking of aliens and intelligent life, uh, because that just looks like us. That's really a projection. The circumstances that led to humans. All right, so, let, so let's just think about it. Let's think about it a little bit. Mammals evolved and were living basically underground because dinosaurs were everywhere. Then there's an asteroid that comes randomly that's big enough to wipe out basically all the dinosaurs and only allow the smallest animals to survive. Small adaptable animals. The mammals evolve, they start to branch off and you get these primates and they're like swinging in trees and stuff and they get their thumbs become opposable. Okay. And then continue to evolve and some of them live in an area where it's not really feasible to be living in trees anymore. And they have to start moving around on the ground. And it helps to be able to stand on two legs for whatever reason. That is something that is, that is helpful. So they can stand on two legs. And when you start moving around on two legs, you're slow. Four-legged animals are faster. They have more legs. They would hunt, you know, other animals. We worked in packs because we were all weak. And there were some people that were, were like hunting and then other people would do other things for the group and we became like very social and developed these complex social dynamics and somehow, and that probably uh, led to us evolving language so that we could communicate better with one another. A massive advantage when you're working against animals who communicate, but not with language, right? Language really opens up the door exponentially. You don't have to now just communicate in the moment based on what's happening. You can refer to other things. You can refer to something y'all did in the past. You can refer to a new idea. You can communicate about how to craft some tool that would be better based on some new plan to hunt or like whatever it is. And again, the ability to craft things is, is possible because we have thumbs, which developed a long time ago. And so there's just, there's just so many things that went to us being two legged, two armed, having the thumbs. And it seems weird to think that other intelligent life would have to go through that exact same thing. But I, but I don't know, maybe. I think that life is common. I think that life is common. Life on Earth was single celled for 3.2 billion years. Nothing but single celled life for 3.2 billion years. And then for some reason, a reason that we don't know, around 500 million years ago, there was something called the Cambrian explosion. And we get all the animals and all the diversity that uh, you know obviously go on to lead to to us and there's something that happened there at the Cambrian explosion and we don't know what it is. There are theories for what it was, but we don't know. If that never happened, then there's no us. And the fact that it took 3.2 billion years to happen tells me that that is a rare event. Whatever led life from going single-celled to highly complex multicellular life is rare. That's a rare thing, whatever it was. That may be one of the big filters right there. But you also have to think about the timing because like I said, in 500 million years or a billion years, the sun is going to heat up and earth won't be habitable. So if the earth is not habitable in 500 million years, just think what if that Cambrian explosion didn't happen 500 million years ago? What if it happened today? 
what if there was just another 500 million years of simple single celled life and today the Cambrian explosion happens and like, you know, life starts to evolve as it does moving forward. I mean, it, it, think about that. What would that mean? That would mean that assuming that the evolution took the same path, which extinction events wouldn't be the same. So, you know, this is very hypothetical. Imagine everything happened in the same way. That means that humans, you and I, come about and reach this level of sophistication in society in 500 million years where we just said that the earth wasn't gonna be habitable anyways. And so it's not possible. And so it's like things have to happen at the exact time that they do for everything to shake out in the way that it has. Maybe it, there's some other filter term that's really important. Maybe when civilizations do get technology, they literally wipe themselves out quickly. We almost did it. We developed nuclear bombs and used them like the next day. Like that's what, ha that's what happened in World War II. We developed it, used it immediately. But maybe we passed the point where everybody is like playing fast and loose with them and we're safe now. Maybe not. Maybe this happens every time there's a new technology. Maybe one of the filters that we're not accounting for is that every time there's a new technology, there's this window of time where it can wipe you out. I'd say that life is probably very common. I think that the type of life that can build rockets and leave their planet, I think is probably exceedingly rare. In our galaxy, in our galaxy, at the very least, we can say it happens probably once a galaxy. There's trillions of galaxies, so surely it's happened trillions of times. The thing is, is we'll never have access to anything that's in another galaxy. It's really questionable whether or not we'd ever have uh, the potential for communication or contact with anything in our galaxy, because the galaxy is so vast. Within the galaxy, like maybe that's something that is just too rare. It's much more rare than we think. And for me, that resolves the paradox, the Fermi paradox. Maybe the intelligence takes so many different forms that any of them would be unrecognizable to us. But what we do know is that there's no evidence around us and no ancient aliens is not evidence and no some grainy footage of something that's flying in the sky that you don't know what it is. That is not evidence of aliens that have tra traversed the galaxy. It just does, it's not. Of course, I couldn't say with 100% certainty, somebody who desperately wants to know about life, extraterrestrial life would be the coolest thing I think that we would ever have been able to discover as a species, as humanity. It surely would be one of the coolest discoveries in the universe. One of the coolest things that you could possibly discover is surely as a life form that evolves on a planet is being able to know anything, first of all, but being able to know that there are other life forms. For somebody who's that excited about it, I, I can tell you that there are absolutely no convincing evidence for aliens being here or having done anything. A lot of this is my opinion. It is based on the science that we know and I can be totally wrong and that's okay.